Good evening, everyone. Nerds of the North, we're back. It's been a long time, but I had to figure out exactly how I was going to do this review. When I f sat down, I finished Path of Daggers, and when I thought about what actually happened in the novel, there wasn't enough there, really, that I remembered that I wanted to talk about for a full episode. And since Path of Daggers starts off the trend of the three books that can technically be all considered one book, but you just had to split it apart. It might not exactly be one, but it's really, really close to the starting point. I just decided, what the hell, I'm going to do a combination video here. So in this video, we're going to be talking about Path of Daggers and Winter's Heart. So... The Path of Daggers. This book was a chore for me to get through both in the physical reading form and actually in the audiobook because one of my favorite characters wasn't actually even included in the story. Now there is a good reason for this. Uh, it's because of Matt Cawthon being injured in the um, Shan Shen invasion of Ebu Dar. So he's out recuperating pretty much so I understand that and I don't fault the book for that but you know when you lose your favorite character kinda sucks just a little bit now one thing that um, is very clearly standing out in my mind and it drives a lot of what actually happens in the uh, further on stories especially with the Sean Chan chasing after the Aes Sedai to try and find this ultimate weapon we have Elaine and uh, Nynaeve and Avienda with the assistance of some of the w women from the Wise Ones, or, or sorry, the uh, Knitting Circle, and some women from the uh, Athan Mier doing the channeling on the Bowl of the Winds to correct the weather. This is where I say that Bonds, this book belongs in the books that continue on. Because in later books, you can still feel the effect of the w the Bowl of the Winds being used, like the sense of the Sidar and Sayadeen just floating in the air. It's picked up by a couple of the channelers every now and then. Uh, of course, you know, the end of the use of the Bowl of the Winds, which was pretty good experience in the novel. It really does stick in your mind. We have everybody trying to escape through a gateway that uh, Elaine has made. And Elaine tries doing what Avienda had done earlier on, which was try to pick apart her weave. Something very tricky and so dangerous that the Aes Sedai themselves do not teach this. This is a wise one's technique only. Because if you lose control of a weave of a single strand of the power, it can collapse into absolutely anything and maybe just cause a gust of wind, maybe cause a loud spark, maybe destroy every woman's ability to channel in the area. So you don't know. I just, I loved the whole atmosphere of it as Elaine starts trying to pick it apart, the Shan Chan show up and... Avienda starts hurling balls of fire through the gateway at them. Brigitte's there launching arrows through, and then they start riding away while still hurling fireballs through the gateway to keep the enemies from coming in. And just as they're getting ready to crest over the hilltop, Elaine loses control. The shield gets slammed between her and the source, so she loses control over the weave. The weave collapses, and kaboom! The entire area is just dead decimated. All three of their horses get killed, the three of them are bloodied, bruised, barely looking like they're able to stand. It was quite a way to start off the book, especially when you're considering now Elaine's completely messed up, and she's now in Andor, where she's going to need to be at her best. So you're Sitting on the little, sitting on the fence a little bit there for the beginning few chapters. Is Elaine going to be okay making it to Andor? Is she going to have time to recover? 
before um, any of the rivals for the throne actually come upon her? Yeah, I don't really know. One of the other things uh, I like about this book, I like and I don't like. Um, we do have a little bit of a story with Perrin, where he goes into Giladon. He does make, um, oh, what's her name? The Queen of Giladon is swears allegiance to him. I'm forgetting her name right now, and I really shouldn't, but I'm forgetting her name. And all this is happening because he's there on his mission from Rand to bring Masima under control and get Masima to Rand. Not so bad. Um, I really don't like how Masima's turned out. Yes, I knew he was a prick from the beginning. Now he's just, like, prick times ten. So... He's not exactly a character I enjoy hearing about, especially with any of the Prophet's men. I like hearing about Perrin, and especially how Perrin, how, how, how he has to deal with things. But... Eh, the Prophet... It's not one of the part of the stories I really like listening to. Now, more than likely that's part and parcel what Robert Jordan planned, because you're not supposed to like the Prophet. He's an asshole. So... If that was what you were planning on doing, congratulations, good job, you definitely got that got that across. Now, keeping along tied with Perrin's story is what happens at the very end of the book. Fail getting kidnapped by Shido. And you just know that the next book, Perrin is going to quite literally be on the borders of insanity due to not having Fail anywhere near him. Yeah, it kind of made it interesting to read, especially considering Perrin still has Bear Lane nearby. Why couldn't Bear Lane get kidnapped? That would have made it a hell of a lot more interesting. But I guess you did need someone still who had I Know How to Deal with Nobles ability left behind. Queen of Giladon, Aleandra. Did come back to me. Oh, let's see. See... This is part of the problem. I don't. Book seven didn't stick in my head very well. Especially coming off of book six, you'd expect book seven to slap right in there, be very strong. And. Strong in. And I'm. Not book seven, sorry. Path of Daggers is book eight. Even then, Crown of Swords finished very strongly with uh, the attack on Ilion. So. Path of Daggers just kind of seemed, you know, a little bit less memorable. And it's a real shame, because I do enjoy the book. It just, it wasn't one of my books that I will go back and reread often. We have a lot of planning and plotting and humming and hawing with Egwene and the Aes Sedai as they're getting ready to actually march on the White Tower now. So that plot's finally moving forward a little bit. Not much, but, you know, it's bound to happen at some point. It's not something you really want to rush, but at the same time, there's only so much building you can actually have going on. Rand and his Ashaman. <clears throat> I admit, I had a feeling for them the beginning, just with how distracted and nonchalantly not caring that Dashiva was, that there was something not quite right about him. Turns out, he's a dreadlord! Great! Isn't that so wonderful? Because he's one of the groups of, one of the members of the Ashaman who attack Rand in the Carrianan Palace, and Rand starts his hunt for them, which will be picked up in the next book. What is very interesting about this is we've heard that Kalendor is flawed. And this is where we finally see it. Uh, when Rand tries to use Kalendor against the Shan Chan, he ends up going slightly mad and summoning lightning down not only upon the Shan Chan, but on his own men. And it's Davram Bashir who knocks Rand clean out of the saddle and is pretty much on the point of beating him senseless to get him to stop channeling. Because he's starting to destroy his own men. 
Oh, well, madness does this types of things, and especially considering how long Rand's been dealing with the power, I can't say we didn't see it coming, but it was still a shock to see it. And I like the fact that it was Dobrain unsaddling uh, Rand and, you know, bringing him under control that way. There is a little bit going on there with uh, some women. I believe one of them wanted to try and slip a dagger into the Lord Dragon while well, she could. I think she was one of the women from Tyr that Rand didn't trust, so he decided to keep her close. Can't clearly remember it, though. So Now, let's move on to Book 9. Let's move on to Winter's Heart. Now, I do admit, Winter's Heart is one of the books that I actually physically own. Um, I own 1 to 6, and then I had by one time I hit 6 and I couldn't read it all the way through, I ended up picking up Winter's Heart because I found the hardcover of it in a bargain bin for $2. I just looked down and went, oh, Wheel of Time book. I have the Wheel of Time stuff. I'll buy the book for $2. This is actually a pretty damn good book with everything that happens inside it. And I'm going to read a quote from the beginning of it just uh, because it's one of... It's really almost a well-fitting quote for the book that in, you know, it's bits and pieces of, of the Koreathon cycle. They're always a good way to start off the Wheel of Time. So... The seals that hold back the night shall weaken, and in the heart of winter shall winter's heart be born amid the wailing of lamentations and the gnashing of teeth. For winter's heart shall ride a black horse, and the name of it is death. That could be taken a lot of different ways. Uh, I'm not going to get into my interpretation of it, because... Interpretation of that part of the Koreathon cycle from Winter's Heart, just using Winter's Heart pieces, would be something I'd have to do after only reading the Winter's Heart. I've read the entire series. I'm going to be pulling bits and pieces from everything now to try and validate that statement. So it's kind of hard to show its true meanings for this book, at least for me, just because there's so much Wheel of Time that just gets jumbled into my head. The story just kind of meshes together quite nicely. Now, this one clearly covers a lot more of Perrin's pursuit of the Shido Ail, and a lot of what happens with Fail while she's actually in dealing with the Shido. Um, potentially the stuff with her becoming one of uh, Savannah's favorites and having to wear the golden necklace and the golden belt and the beginnings of other, uh, oh, what's the term? I'm forgetting the Aiel term for the servants. And I feel really bad because an Aiel wouldn't call them servants. Gaishine. And she's starting to uh, get other Gaishine with her. And they're starting to swear an allegiance to her of sorts. It's good to see because it shows, you know, here's Fail. She's not going to be waiting for someone to come and rescue her. She's got her own teeth and claws, and she's going to get out. It's part of why I really like the character of Fail Bashir. Or Zareen, if you want to use her actual name. But it's only bits and pieces of it. There's some, but I know some of the other books have a lot more. So I'm, I'm waiting, to be perfectly honest here, I'm waiting for Malden. I'm waiting for the storming of Malden, because I re clearly remember that, and that was great. Uh, we have Elaine solidifying her grip on the Lion Throne. More so, however, we have Elaine, Avienda, and Min bonding Rand as their warder. And we get the moments of Elaine getting pregnant with the Dragon Reborn's children. Which is really funny when you get to the scene of Min, Avienda, and Birgitta 
all standing drunkenly in the hallway because they're all feeling what's going through Elaine's bond right now. And the other girls are feeling it through Rand's bond. And they're kind of drunkenly staggering against each other and trying to get out of public eye. Just imagine for a second what feeling that coming from another would be like. Intoxicating and hard to walk kind of makes sense, and that's being polite. These girls would be pretty messed up. One of the main things I love about Winter's Heart is we get Matt back! Yeah, Matt! There's a lot of stuff going on with Matt in this point. Matt getting approached by, uh, Islewyn? Lylewyn. Rand getting approached by Lylewyn and Bail Doman to get him to help them escape Ebu Dar. Uh, also him getting approached by Mistress Anan to help get some of the remaining Aes Sedai out of Ebu Dar, who didn't get captured. We also have... Well, the funniest part is Matt discovering who Tuan is. The moment you hear Tuan get mentioned and they bring out the Daughter of the Nine Moons, you're just waiting, waiting for Tuan and Matt to come across each other. Tuan's offers to buy Matt a couple of times. I like the fact that Tuan's constantly calling him Toy, just to get under Matt's skin. Uh, I love the character of Tuan. I, I think she's a great character, and she's, to be honest, the perfect opposite to balance Matt. The two of them work great together. As you can see later on in Crossroads of Twilight. But, in Winter's Heart, they don't really get along too, too well. Especially considering during Matt's escape attempt, they, uh, Tuon finds him. And he tries to grab onto her and she shows that she's not just some pretty little flower. She's going to start kicking the crap out of him. And then there's the proposal. In the crazy Sean Chen way of the daughter of the nine moons is my wife. The daughter of the nine moons is my wife. Oh, blood and bloody ashes, the daughter of the nine moons is my bloody wife. Congratulations, Matt. You've just proposed to Tuan. And Solusha is freaking. I love the reaction that Solusha has. Lylewyn is just as freaked out. We've got the Panarch of Terabon, who's currently a Daco Vale that we have, um... What's his name? The Thief Taker. Thief Catcher. Whatever you want to call Um... Yeah. Him. Escorting out, because for some reason it's either a love relationship or he actually knows who she is and wants to get her out. But in the end, we have Matt kidnapping Tuon. It's pretty funny. I'm glad it happened. Um, and we're meeting Noel. Noel is quite the interesting character. I'll be perfectly honest. Um, and this is... Well, you know what? Forget spoilers, because if you're watching these videos and you haven't read The Wheel of Time, what's wrong with you? Just who Noel turns out to be was a shocker when that was revealed. I remember having to stop reading Tower of Midnight and go back a few chapters and reread the entire dealings with the Aelfin and Eelfin again, just to make sure I didn't miss something. But who Noel turned out to be was pretty awesome. I like Rand, you know, having to get away from Farmatting, because he goes to Farmatting to hunt the Ashaman, gets in some serious trouble in Farmatting. No kidding. It's a city that absolutely hates channeling, and st you're going to let mild channeling happen around there and start killing other men who can channel? Yeah, you're going to get attract. You're going to attract notice. You're seriously going to attract notice. And this is where you start to see just how awesome Cad Swain Melidrin is compared to everyone else in the world, because she's apparently known everywhere, and everybody doesn't like her, or has problems with her, or what have we, and this is also where you learn Cad Swain's from Farmatting. 
So she's used to the Guardian. That's probably why she left so early. But the best part about this is Rand and Nynaeve going out and taking on the Shoda with the Chodan call with Rand's plan to cure the male half of the source. Purging the taint by quite interestingly channeling the taint into Shadar Logoth. Not bad. Interesting. And sure enough, it worked. Shadar Logoth was completely destroyed. I think that's a good thing. And the taint is gone. It took a day of channeling, which is quite... This is the part that I'm... Is clearly the part that a lot of other books constantly reference back to. Because even in the next book, T uh, Crossroads of Twilight, you'll have characters walking around and then just suddenly... Or, huh? What's over here? Because they're sensing the column of power. Men and women both. They're sensing the use of the Chodan Kal. So, it's kind of a... As they describe it in the books, it's a beacon. And everybody looks to it. And it's a beacon that goes on for a day, pretty much. So yeah, people are a little bit weirded out by what's going on. For Winner's Heart, you know, the cleansing of Sayadeen? That was pretty much the big ticket item. You know, that's the, that's the big thing that happened, so... I'll have more episodes up for you guys pretty soon. This is the end of my talk for The Path of Daggers and Winter's Heart. Coming up soon, I'm not sure if I'm going to do Crossroads of Twilight as an individual review. I more than likely will, because if I remember correctly, Knife of Dreams has a lot of stuff I want to talk about. Because if I got it right, Knife of Dreams has an interesting battle with Matt Cawthon. But it's been a while since I've gone back and gone through them. I'm currently halfway through Crossroads of Twilight. So we will see what we shall see when we get to the end of Crossroads. Until then, may the wheel turn on. This is Nerds of the North. I'll be back with more, I promise.